So far in the u substitution chapter for definite integrals, we've done translating the x values to u values, and I want to take a look at that and another option, and maybe a third option, and see what we think. So what's the way we would do this at this point? We would say, uh, I'm going to leave a separate column here. Um, so we'd say u equals what pi t, du, du equals pi dt, 1 over pi du equals dt, and then we'd make a little translation table, right? We'd say um, when t is 0 and 1, u, which is pi t, uh, is 0 times pi, which is 0, or 1 times pi, which is pi. And then we'd translate everything to u's, so we'd say u equals 0 to u equals pi, sine of u times 1 over pi du. And then we'd do the integration, do the actual uh, antiderivative, and say integral of sine is what? Cosine? Negative cosine? Negative cosine. Of u from u equals 0 to u equals pi. Oh, I forgot a uh, 1 over pi, so 1 over pi times that. In fact, we could do that and then continue on. So that's the way we've uh, been introduced to doing it. Another way to think of it is to do the same thing to begin with. So u equals pi t, du equals pi dt, 1 over pi du equals dt. But then this part, we're going to skip, not translate the t values to u values. And then when I rewrite it in terms of u, well, I can't put in the old t values because that's just wrong, but I could just not write anything. Just not write anything for the upper and lower bounds. So I could write, uh, and I mean like the start and stop point. So I'm going to write the integral of sine of u times 1 over pi du. Same thing I wrote for an integrand here, but just no start and stop. So treat this as, anti treat this as indefinite. Um, temporarily. Um, and then what's that indefinite integral? It's 1 over pi times negative cosine of u, which is what we did there. And then we're going to substitute back and say 1 over pi times negative cosine of pi t. And I'm going to call that big F of t. So this is, it's almost like a little side calculation or a calculation off in indefinite land rather than definite land. And now I have an antiderivative in terms of t. And I think that's really useful because my original function was in terms of t. I often want to look at its antiderivative in the original variable that I was using, not some other variable that's scaled or, or something. Um, so now back to definite territory. Now I can write f of t from t equals 0 to t equals 1. So I didn't have to substitute uh, and do a little translation table. Or if, if you want, you could write 1 over pi times negative cosine of pi t from t equals 0 to t equals 1 and then plug in. Um, when you do that, what are you going to get? So we'll have negative cosine of pi times 1 minus minus cosine of pi times 0. And pi times 1 is what we would have done if we had plugged in u equals pi here. And pi times 0 is what we would have done if we plugged in u equals 0 here. So in some sense, we're still doing the same work. And this might seem like it's a little longer. I mean, it's, it's kind of a balancing act, right? I don't have to write a little translation table. And I don't have to remember to put the new u start and stop values in the integral. I just don't even bother writing them. 
So I think it takes about the same amount of time. Most people um, are taught to do it this way, so they like doing it this way. But the reason I like this is that, um, for one, I get to see the antiderivative in terms of my original variable, which I already mentioned. Um, so we'll say, yay, you get to see the antiderivative in terms of the original variable. And you can check by taking the derivative of big F either by hand using formulas or using Desmos. So I think there's a lot of good ways, good, good things about this idea of switching to indefinite for a little while and then um, not having to translate your upper, your start and stop. Um, in particular, this method is okay if you're just doing the integral once, just from zero to one. But what if you want the integral from zero to one and zero to two and zero to three and zero to three and a half and zero to 3.09 and zero to negative five? You'd have to be making a translation table every single time but if you do it this way, you get a function, and you can just plug in whatever new value and, and uh, your starting point, and you don't have to be thinking about doing that translation every time this kind of back substitution is doing it for you. So I really urge you to think about um, which way makes sense for any particular problem. Um, maybe do it a few times this way, because that's what may later calculus professors might expect. But in applications, I would almost think uh, where you, you have some original function that you care about in the original variable, sticking with that original variable as much as possible is nice and handy. Let's look at uh, another issue on the same basic topic. Let's say we had uh, the integral, um, let's say, 0 to 0 0.5, um, let's do the same thing, sine of pi t dt. Um, so we just tried this and we did it two ways. We could also say, let's use a big four shortcut and say that the integral is, well, integral of sine is negative cosine. Copy the linear part, the phi t, multiply by 1 over whatever slope is hitting the t and then um, we'll just we'll emphasize that this is still t equals 0 t equals 0 0.5 you can put the bracket outside the minus or inside the minus it doesn't matter and so I managed to do the antiderivative using a big four rule and not even have to think about u substitution not think about whether I wanted my uh, start and stop points to be translated from u values to t values or not. Um, so this is great, I think. Uh, so it avoids the u substitution. Uh, don't need to translate t values to u values. So uh, why don't we have you practice it again? How about the integral from 0 to 4 e to the negative x dx? I know we just did that one in another video, but here's a chance to do it using a big 4 rule. OK, pause the video. Come back. Welcome back. Um, so negative x, you could write it as negative 1 times x, which we could say is a times x, where a is a constant, a negative 1. So we could say this integral is integral of e to the negative x is e to the negative x times 1 over a, which is 1 over negative 1, from x equals 0 to x equals 4. Again, I didn't have to translate between t or x and u. I can pull the minus outside, and I get e to the negative 4 minus e to the 0, which I got before. It's looking bad because we got that negative there. 
but e to the minus 4 is smaller than e to the 0. Um, so we get negative, negative 0.98-ish. So we get positive 0.98-ish. So again, um, the, uh, the overall answer was positive. We knew that, and we did end up with a positive. Uh, let me give you a quick other practice problem. How about the integral 0 to 4 e to the negative 3x? Well, uh, you'd say a equals negative 3. And so you get e to the negative 3x times 1 over negative 3 x equals 0 to x equals 4. Same basic idea. And how about integral 0 to pi sine e to the x dx? What do you think? So uh, up here we were using a big 4 rule. But here we can't use a big 4 rule because it's not just a linear function of x on the inside. It turns out for this one there is no formula-based antiderivative. Um, U substitution fails, even more advanced techniques from Calc 2 fail, um, which is a shame because this is a formula for a chirp, so that means that there's just no way to integrate this chirp and get a, uh, get a nice antiderivative formula. So what do we do in that case? We do numeric integration, like chapter 5.5.